So hello everyone, good morning and good evening. Uh, thanks for joining for the kickoff meeting of the new season of AAPG Salt Basin's Technical Interest Group. I would like to thank Gabor for accepting to start the season with such an interesting topic. So Gabor is the chief geologist at ONV Petron Group. He's dealing with the geological aspects of global exploration efforts across the business. He graduated his PhD at the Rice University, and then he joined, he joined Amoco in 1994 in Houston. He worked on several exploration assignments, such as offshore Romania, offshore Angola. He later joined Vanco Energy as chief, chief geophysicist and later became vice president of geosciences. And in 2007, Gabor moved to Vienna and worked on a large number of exploration projects in various basins in Europe, Africa, Middle East, and Asia. Besides teaching international courses at OMV Petrom on seismic data interpretation, salt tectonics, and prospect generation, Gabor also takes a keen interest in education of the next, next generation of geoscientists externally for various academic institutions and geosocieties. Today, he will talk about the evaporites in the context of, of energy transition. And without further ado, Gabor, the floor is yours. Then thank you very much. Let me share my screen. And uh, good afternoon to, to all of you guys. Uh, does it look good on, on your side, uh, Dan, the, the screen and everything? I think you might want to select the other screen. That's right. Or yes. this one, right? Yes. OK, it's better now. Cool. Now it's perfect. Thank you. So. Again, uh, as, as you said, good afternoon, good morning uh, to, to all of you. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, then asked me to, to kick off this uh, uh, season for this technical interest group on, on salt tectonics. And I thought that, well, one topic might be very relevant and might be typical or, or more and more getting typical for some of us uh, going through or going into this energy transition uh, uh, storyline. And what I'm going to do, I will uh, offer a, a kind of a personal perspective, which is based on, on what I do these days, which is not any more deep water uh, subsalt uh, um, uh, exploration, but something quite different. And there's a reason for uh, I chose to put evaporites uh, in the title instead of salt for reasons you will, you will uh, uh, hopefully appreciate uh, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Just two words, uh, two slides about uh, the global energy mix as of today, as it uh, relates to the energy transition. As you might all know, oil and gas as of today is the, the big uh, energy uh, source for all of us. Sorry, I have some uh, teenage kids at home, so you will hear some background noise and you know what it is, sorry. Uh, coal, the nasty thing is 25%, and then we have these other things, uh, obvious things, and uh, most importantly, uh, this, a kind of uh, renewable sector is not that strong as of as of today, but the expectation that uh, by 2050 uh, we will have to dial back the oil and gas part, which was 53 on the previous slide, uh, by then should be on 37, should shrink in order to reach the the, the climate uh, goals we all have on this planet. And there are some other interesting changes which we're not going to get into. The one important thing I'd like to emphasize on the slide is that is this new entry uh, uh, under the renewables category, and that is hydrogen. And some of the stuff, uh, well, pretty, pretty much most of the stuff I'm going to show you is really revolving around either hydrogen exploration or, or hydrogen storage. And my point is, and this could be a takeaway, is that uh, this uh, field uh, we're going to move into collectively has a huge element of salt tectonics. So even though we are going into uh, to this energy transition uh, where we have to do less of this oil and gas, but there are replacement aspects which uh, still require, or even more so perhaps, uh, the good understanding of salt tectonics anywhere on this planet. So let me dwell a little bit on the natural or geologic or white or gold hydrogen. This is the, 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 the hydrogen version, which is uh, 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 not man-made, but uh, uh, produced by mother nature, if you will. And without going into details, the, the part which is really important here is that uh, a lot of the ongoing 
hydrogen exploration efforts are really revolving around uh, uh, salt tectonics, trying to find hydrogen accumulations in a pre-salt setting. And I'm going to show you some examples from the Ukraine, which uh, uh, obviously pretty much on, on all of us um, are watching the news. And uh, so, so I thought that this would be very proper to, uh, to start to use some Ukrainian examples to, to show this uh, aspect, all right? So um, let me take you to the Dnieper Donetsk uh, Basin. And that is on the news. And then to orient you, this is a big, big uh, 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 Devonian uh, failed rift system, which swings around uh, across uh, most of the Ukraine and goes out to the to the east. And to the northwest, it uh, continues to the Pipia uh, Basin, which is in uh, White Russia in Belarus. Uh, Belarus. Uh, okay, so it's a very big old. Reef basin, which has uh, lots of uh, uh, salt in it, as I'll show you in the, in the next few slides. And uh, just to orient you, this is uh, uh, Kiev uh, for your reference, and this is Donetsk. Again, uh, you can hear about these things quite often on the news every day, practically. Why is it a very cool basin in terms of salt tectonics? Because it has a double decker. Uh, it has the main salt in it, which is Devonian in age, uh, uh, and then it could be quite thick. Could be even a few kilometers thick here and there. It's uh, is the pre-rift as people uh, refer to it. But uh, as for the salt, in my view and then some other people's view, it's really a scenery salt, if you will. And then there's a very thick carboniferous sequence, and then we see another salt uh, 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 sequence, which is Permian in age, uh, age equivalent to some of the the famous European uh, uh, salt basins. Uh, uh, age-wise. So we have a double-decker. It's the lower on the Devonian uh, salt, which drives the show, uh, if you will. And this is kind of a, a generic cross-section across the Nepal Donetsk Basin, orientation southwest, northeast. And what you can see here, even though the scale is missing, that it's a very, very deep basin, uh, almost 10 kilometers uh, uh, here and there. And there is this lower Devonian salt, uh, and then this is the upper Permian salt. And of course, the, perhaps some of us would have uh, drawn this differently, but these two salt layers do interact and make, uh, uh, they make the, the salt tectonics kind of uh, exciting uh, in this basin. But there are multiple phases of growth associated with the salt and all of the inversion. It's, it's a very exciting uh, basin, very complex basin. And I have to say that this is also a super basin uh, it's an APG uh, uh, talk, and then all of us are familiar with the super basin concept. I have to say that this basin didn't make the, the, the list, even though it has uh, about 35, 38 billion barrels of oil equivalent fund in it to date. So it's a really a big time super uh, uh, basin. Keep that in mind. Uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, activity historically uh, addressing the, the salt tectonics. Uh, I'm just using some published uh, 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 data from uh, Sergei Stovba and Randall Stevenson, 2003. Uh, these are 2D seismic lines, but they could give you the flavor how things look like. And on this salt tectonic map, basically the, the subdivision is that you have salt diapers in black here and there. What's really dominating the picture across the entire basin, this is scale, uh, 100 kilometers, and the north is a little bit rotated to your uh, upper left-hand corner, is that the whole basin is really dominated by more like salt pillows, and therefore anticlinal features like this, and really very classical looking, uh, aggressive salt diapirs uh, are not that typical in this uh, basin. And these are the, uh, major unconformities the previous uh, slide was referring to. There's a lot of action all the way up to the Cenozoic. And you can see that, for example, this diapic feature is really reactivating itself uh, during the, the neogene. All right, from uh, an oil and gas point of view, again, this is a classic basin. Uh, people worked uh, here for the longest time. Our Ukrainian uh, colleagues did work uh, here for the longest time. And therefore, uh, there's a lot of data uh, out there. Uh, perhaps the publications are a little bit biased, very much biased towards the Soviet age literature. Uh, and therefore, you are not so familiar with this basin. 
yet. The salt tectonics is really superb. And of course, you find a lot of traps in the uh, post-salt sequence. That's the, the easy thing uh, to go after. But there are many indications and there are existing fields which were found in the uh, pre-salt sequence. So stuff which is found within the uh, Devonian, but below the, the deeper, the older Devonian uh, salt in positions like this. This uh, particular example I picked from uh, 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 Belarus, from White Russia, if you will, and this is the regional cross section which goes uh, uh, along with it. This is the picture section of the whole uh, reef system, and you can see the, the salt tectonics uh, being very, very spectacular and being confined uh, between the reef shoulders of this uh, failed Devonian reef system. Right here, you can see that uh, uh, there are a lot of interesting details, many layers of salt, upper salt, lower salt that the, the local experts refer to, and then intersalt accumulation, not just this, but many other examples. And of course, uh, uh, oil being found, oil and gas being found uh, uh, beneath the salt itself. Now, why is it important? Because the, the basin is fairly mature from a classical oil and gas uh, point of view. Of course, there's a lot of running room still, Having a better understanding of the of the pre-salt uh, potential, meaning uh, acquiring more uh, 3D seismic data, uh, modern seismic data, doing the right thing, PSDM and all the good things. And I'm sure you had many uh, speakers who addressed this uh, uh, aspect of salt tectonics. So there's a lot of running room uh, uh, in that sense. But there's another uh, interesting aspect which just popped up uh, in this basin about uh, uh, two years ago when people realized uh, that many of the, the gas fields, which are sitting below the Devonian salt, the gas has a lot of hydrogen in it. And the numbers you see are quite big uh, if you are uh, uh, into hydrogen exploration. Even just a few percent of uh, hydrogen in a gas, in a blended gas is a big deal. And some of these numbers go up uh, uh, as high as almost uh, 24 uh, percent. And no wonder our Ukrainian colleagues were quite excited, and I'm sure they are uh, still very excited about uh, the possibility of, of having natural gas extracted from below the Devonian salt. And the point to sign what I'm going to make here is that obviously this thick salt, uh, which has a lot of halite in it, is capable to holding back the, uh, the hydrogen. I come back to, to hydrogen being a very tricky gas compared to regular methane and other gases in terms of, of trying to contain it. Uh, but the, uh, the takeaway here is that there is prospectivity here, which is salt tectonic related, and it's going beyond the classical oil and gas paradigm. It's, it's hydrogen, natural hydrogen. As far as the geography, this is the border with Russia. And again, by now, you are familiar with some of the names like Kharkiv. And uh, uh, without going to details, uh, this is where all the all the, the war uh, operations are uh, ongoing, uh, exactly across the Dnieper Donetsk uh, basin, the southeastern uh, end of it. As interesting side note is that uh, uh, the colleagues, Ukrainian colleagues, uh, were so excited about this thing, uh, this uh, pre-salt hydrogen potential, that they uh, wrote a couple of letters to Mr. Zelensky. That was back in 2020. Uh, they didn't get an answer, and, and I have to say probably they won't get an answer anytime soon because Mr. Zelensky has much bigger uh, uh, challenges on his hand than, uh, than this particular thing. Yet the salt tectonics is uh, quite important here. And this is how I try to, to summarize uh, the challenge here, not just in the Dnieper Donetsk basin, but many other onshore salt basins, which we won't have time to, to get into. And the storyline really here is that uh, in these big salt basins, uh, there is um, a, a clear tendency to find pre-salt accumulations when you have pre-salt uh, source rock. And this seems to be the case in the Nieper Dunyas Basin too. But as you approach the, the edge of the basin, the reef shoulder itself, uh, you run out of source rocks. Uh, and people realize this in this basin and in other basins, and they stop drilling uh, uh, for uh, pre-salt targets getting closer to the reef shoulder. But if you have 
uh, hydrogen in mind, hydrogen plus helium, which is another important uh, gas to go after, then one needs to relook this part of the salt basin because you might not have uh, methane, but you have these other gases, which are uh, uh, very, very important. So what I'm saying here is that this forgotten or kind of uh, ignored large segments of the salt basin, for example, in the Nieper Dunas basin, will have to be relooked with this thing in mind. And this is a new perspective on the exploration uh, uh, in this basin and again, many other onshore large salt basin worldwide. Let me take you to a, a, a another place, uh, the other side of the planet, if you will. Amadeus Basin in Australia, in the middle of uh, the Australian continent right here. It's a spectacular uh, uh, salt basin in the sense that the structures are very well developed. Uh, there was some uh, hydrocarbon exploration, which was successful. There is oil and gas in this basin, not as much as uh, uh, in the Nepardonias Basin, but it's a proven uh, a petroleum basin. And the salt, which happens to be very, very old, Precambrian, uh, uh, cryogenic in age, uh, is doing wonderful things. The people uh, published uh, well on this salt basin. And what came about just the last few years is the recognition is that it's not just about oil and gas in this basin, but in the pre-salt uh, uh, succession, there is, there is more to look after. And again, the same story, Hydrogen and helium uh, could be found here. And some of the wells which were drilled, not for these uh, substances, but uh, they did find and they did document the presence of these gases uh, uh, next to, to natural gas. So all of a sudden, we see the same thing here. The understanding of how salt tectonics work uh, in a basin is incredibly important with the energy transition in mind, not so much the oil and gas aspects, but this hydrogen, the natural hydrogen. Some people call it the white, some other call it the gold or geologic uh, or natural or even native uh, uh, hydrogen is now in the limelight. And we have to understand the salt tectonics uh, uh, very, very well, just like for an oil and gas uh, 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 prospect. This is an example which has been published uh, showing a well which was trying to get into the pre-salt succession, didn't, didn't quite manage uh, uh, to reach this part. But the play is really about uh, what you're going to find here. And if you find uh, oil and gas and uh, 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 gas in particular, natural gas and uh, uh, hydrogen and perhaps even helium, you have a very, very viable uh, project. So it's really for me, it's, it's a nice flavor uh, of, of, of what's going on with energy transition in relation to salt tectonics. Let me show you an example of the well correlation from this uh, basin, Amadeus Basin. And here you can see uh, this evaporite formation, which has uh, sometimes uh, almost totally um, halide, this green color thing. And then uh, laterally uh, moving along, uh, you have just uh, anhydrides, that's the lateral equivalent. So you do see a lot of lateral variations, again, halite embedded in an anhydride sequence, all right? So there are a lot of exciting uh, uh, aspects of salt tectonics, which one has to, to understand. Now, coming back to, to the hydrogen aspect, uh, what's very important uh, is the, the observations some people made just as recently as uh, last year, uh, there are these fairy uh, circles. People typically relate to, to hydrogen escaping to the, to the surface. So it's like a mega seep, if you will, uh, for hydrogen, not for other gases. And people map these uh, uh, fairy circles uh, or fairy circle looking things along uh, uh, a very long, long linear line like this. And uh, the supposition or the proposition could be that this is the zero edge of the salt basin uh, underneath. So indeed the salt is able to hold back the hydrogen, but once you don't have salt, you uh, reach the edge of the salt basin, then the hydrogen could get away and it does get away and then uh, uh, seeps to the surface and makes this beautiful uh, trend of, of uh, very circle looking uh, features. All right. Let me take you to, to Spain, the Southern uh, Pyrenean foothills. Uh, and then this is also a very uh, interesting area because for the first time in Europe, people started to look into 
uh, a hydrogen exploration uh, project uh, uh, with, the, with drilling in mind, actual drilling in mind. And uh, this is a company called uh, Helios, and they did some very good work, whereas they uh, identified an area where some of the vintage wells actually reported uh, hydrogen and helium uh, uh, in them. Let me show you a few uh, cross sections just to, to make sure that we all appreciate that this is a very, very classic salt basin. People did wonderful uh, salt tectonic studies here. Other uh, folks from Barcelona University and other folks. Uh, the outcropping salt diapirs are shown in this magenta color. There are quite a few. And then the cross sections I'm going to show you, they were published by uh, some colleagues in 2017. And uh, I'll show you two wells later on, this well and that well, but really the exploration efforts for hydrogen uh, and helium uh, are really happening here at the very foreland uh, uh, edge of the, of the salt basin. Here you have the, the Triassic salt, this is darker colors, and you have this lighter colored uh, uh, anhydrides, pink color, which are oligocene in, in age. So let me get you a little bit closer. And this is a, a published uh, uh, example of how this thing uh, could uh, 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 work. This is the Monzon one well, which was drilled uh, uh, in the past and uh, drilled all the way down uh, through the Triassic uh, uh, salt and then reached uh, the lower Triassic uh, uh, sandstones. And the suggestion is that since this well found uh, uh, helium and hydrogen uh, traces, then this is the exploration target for, with a hydro, hydrogen in, in mind, a natural hydrogen in mind. And then the salt, the Triassic salt, will be the, the seal rock holding this thing back. It's a totally fine exploration concept for hydrogen. Uh, they, they will hopefully uh, address uh, this prospect by uh, modern drilling. These vintage wells, of course, they didn't look for hydrogen uh, per se. And then the other important aspect on this very seismic section is that one thing is to find natural hydrogen, but everywhere on this planet, people are talking about the green and blue and gray and pink and yellow and uh, all kind of uh, hydrogen products, which are all man-made products. And once you have those things manufactured or fabricated anywhere, for example, here in Spain, where there's plenty of uh, sunshine, so you might want to consider uh, doing uh, a green hydrogen on the surface. Once you produce it, you want to uh, put it away. You have to store it. And this is the very important other aspect of salt tectonics, which I see in many places emerging, is that, OK, uh, finding natural hydrogen is one thing, but to storing hydrogen, regardless of its color, whether it's man-made or natural, it's another challenge will, which will require a lot of good understanding of salt tectonics. And the challenge, challenge here is that could we consider a trap, a storage facility under this uh, oligocene barbastro evaporites? Mind you, these are not halides, but uh, evaporites in general. And I'll show you in the next slide uh, or the after. Uh, these are actually gypsum on the surface and, and, and hydrides in the subsurface. So, but finishing the story about the hydrogen uh, exploration effort, if you want to look at it in a kind of a, uh, a already drilled well uh, sequence perspective, then this is what it is. We are looking at the, uh, uh, the Muschakalk and Kuiper, these are uh, European uh, terms to describe the upper, middle, upper uh, Triassic. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, uh, massive salt uh, in the sequence. And then uh, there are anhydrides uh, in between. And it's a fairly complex uh, uh, sequence with some other uh, limestone features uh, in between, which is a typical feature of this Triassic uh, uh, sequence across much of Europe. And then from a hydrogen point of view, you are looking for a, a pre-salt, quote unquote, target with some kind of plastics above the basement because the hydrogen is coming up from the basement. And then these guys uh, are basically looking uh, uh, for the hydrogen to be found uh, in this uh, stratigraphic sequence. Now, I mentioned the, the storage issue. And then, quite frankly, the, the question we all have to ask ourselves is that, OK, uh, we do know that salt, in particular, can hold back uh, uh, any kind of gas, even, even hydrogen, very well. 
But how about if you have, if you don't have nice clean soap, halite, but instead you have just kind of uh, uh, anhydrites and gypsum and all kind of uh, dirty rocks, if you will, would they work uh, for you as the ultimate top seed? They're gonna hold back hydrogen if you think about storage, for example. And there's an ongoing discussion uh, about this thing. So let me leave this uh, question open-ended, how good your evaporite top seal, super seal uh, uh, would have to be for hydrogen uh, containment uh, in particular. Because really truly, and this could be a good visual, is that hydrogen is the Houdini of all gases. It has the tendency to get away from almost anywhere and then the, if you think about containment and sealing, you have to be really very, very careful how you're gonna hold this uh, substance back as opposed to other things like uh, 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 biogenic gas and, and, and oil in particular. You have to be much more uh, cautious how you're gonna uh, try to contain uh, hydrogen in particular. This is a wonderful slide, which is uh, taken from a, a verb by uh, the Bureau of Economic Geology folks from Duffy and all, uh, it's in press. I decided to put this in and then uh, let me just volunteer these guys to, to give uh, the next talk or one of the next talks because it's a wonderful paper they put together. The thing is that they really try to address the, the storage uh, issues in, in terms of the energy transition technologies. And I'm not gonna uh, walk through this uh, slide because they, they have to do it. Uh, it's, it's their baby. It's really, really very nice work. The one thing I would say though, is that uh, the way they depict uh, the situation is very specific to, to halide dominated uh, features. The only uh, 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 exception is this uh, amyl uh, diapir, which has a little bit of anhydride, but all of these other features are having good uh, halide, dominated by halide, which is again a good super seal. And that's not always the case. And I'll show you some examples in Europe where you don't have this luxury of having good halide. And the other issue here is that you don't have the luxury of having well-behaved uh, diapirs either everywhere. It just doesn't work like that. And I'll come back to this six. So this is a, Excellent, excellent uh, summary of what you can do once you have halide dominated salt features which uh, form themselves into a, a, a kind of a diapir stage. But this is the trick is thinking about Europe in terms of hydrogen storage in salt in particular. Uh, this compilation, which is a fairly recent one by uh, uh, some colleagues from Germany, you see a bias, or I do see a bias. Uh, which is revolving around the very well known, very well established classic, if you will, uh, uh, salt basins, which run across northern part of, of Europe, uh, from the North Sea all the way to the Netherlands, Germany, and all the way to Poland. These are these big classic uh, 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 salt diapirs, which all read the textbook. They look absolutely fantastic. They have a very nice clean composition for most part. So they are perfect for uh, storage uh, issues. Not only hydrogen, but uh, many other things you can store in these things, compressed air and, and you name it. But the map is, uh, is very um, kind of uh, assault provoking, at least for me, because if I look at the map and I'm looking at all the other countries in Europe, I see that most of the countries do not have any salt on this map, but it's not true. There are many other uh, salt basins uh, which are neglected on this map. And they are not that classic, they are not so well studied, and they are not even salt, they are not even halite for most part. They might be just anhydrite or gypsum, but many of these countries will have to have a storage solution. So they have to work with whatever they've got. And for example, in Romania, you can see this, I don't know where my cursor went, but uh, if you see it, this is Transylvania, very close to Dan's heart. Uh, Dan is sitting somewhere here in Cluj. And we know a lot about this uh, neogene salt. And, but there are many other salt in the neighborhood. I'm sitting right here in Austria. And then we do know that we have a lot of uh, uh, permotriacic salt sequence in, in, in uh, uh, Austria as well, in the Eastern Alps. A lot of papers about it. They are not so well behaved like the ones I mentioned before 
yet this is what we have. So we have to find a solution to store either hydrogens or some other gases in our uh, evaporite uh, accumulations, regardless how difficult that will be, we have to try. Now, let me take you back to, to the Ukraine uh, uh, one more time. This is a field, the uh, Lokachi field, which is uh, sitting at the border of, uh, of Poland and the Ukraine. This is uh, Lviv, so we are going a little bit to the north from Lviv. And it's a field which has been found a long time ago. It's a Devonian uh, age uh, reservoir sequence. You have a lot of shallow water uh, limestones, which is the reservoir separated by anhydride, not salt, but anhydride layers, many of them, okay? There's a vertical exaggeration 10 times, and this is kind of a scale for you. And what our Ukrainian people, uh, colleagues found, besides the, 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 the gas itself, the natural gas itself, that they did measure uh, other gases. And in particular, they measured hydrogen. And the hydrogen uh, is coming from below, and the observation here is that the, the anhydride can hold back the hydrogen, but not perfectly. Uh, this skinny uh, anhydride layers uh, kind of slow down the, the hydrogen going towards the, the surface. In the lowermost few uh, units, you do have hydrogen and you don't have hydrogen on top uh, anymore. So again, the point here is that uh, uh, evaporites in general, might not uh, perform uh, super tight uh, as far as uh, hydrogen storage or hydrogen exploration is concerned. So something uh, to, to think about, and I guess collectively as an industry, uh, we have to do a lot of work uh, to establish uh, the, 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 the rules of this um, uh, uh, game. Let me take you to Libya. Uh, we do work in Libya, uh, my company on before a long time, and Libya is known for a lot of great uh, geology. Uh, it also made uh, the headlines uh, many times over in the last few years uh, for, for the war situation, uh, uh, which, is, which is ongoing to a certain extent. But the geology uh, and the oil and gas, uh, petroleum geology is fantastic. And we do know a lot uh, about this uh, uh, seared basin in particular. This is the coastline, by the way, just to orient you, this is the Mediterranean Sea, this is the coastline right here. And you are looking at the sea embayment here. And this particular, and everybody can relate to the Messinian salt uh, uh, offshore. But what's very interesting, and I'll show you an example or two here, is that this onshore, uh, a little very large evaporite basin, and this is the scale, 100 kilometers. So you can appreciate the huge size of this evaporite basin, which is Eocene, Eprasian in age. And most of this uh, uh, basin is actually not salt. It's not a halite basin. The halite is relatively small in this large basin. And uh, uh, about, let's say, 95% uh, of, the, of the basin is dominated by anhydrides, which is this pink thing. And in a cross-sectional sense, you can also uh, get the same message is that really rock salt, this green, is just a relatively small fraction of a very, very large uh, evaporite uh, uh, basin dominated by, by anhydrides. So why is it important from an energy transition point of view? There's a lot of good uh, work done on this, uh, on this eocene uh, anhydrides. And I'll show you a minute uh, uh, how this kind of cyclo things look like in a minute, because there is oil production from in between the anhydride uh, layers. But the, the, the question will go beyond uh, oil and gas, again, from an uh, energy transition point of view. This is a fantastic uh, uh, play, uh, a complicated one. It all revolves around the, the reservoir characteristics of the, of the evaporites separating uh, sometimes non-reservoir uh, carbonates versus really good quality reservoir dolomites. And then if you look around uh, in onshore Libya, you do see this uh, evaporite layer all over the place as the map suggested. And there are a lot of fields which were found uh, below this thing because it does act as a, a super seal. 
And uh, without going to the details, there are a lot of established uh, uh, fields which are sitting just immediately below this evaporite, years in evaporite uh, layer. Now, because of the pre salt kitchen, uh, this is not uh, always working display. Sometimes you drill on this size and you don't have anything below the salt. But, sorry, I can try to make this go away. Uh, but in basin uh, segments where exploration, traditional exploration didn't succeed to produce oil and gas accumulation, now one could go back and try to look for hydrogen accumulation because the hydrogen kitchen is a very different animal compared to, to the oil and gas kitchen, which we are very familiar with, which has something to do with salt rocks sitting in the basin, female, that kind of stuff. The hydrogen is coming up from the basement and in basin segments or in highs where we tried and, and drilled and we uh, came up with nothing and we uh, kind of neglected them, now we are thinking about perhaps going back and then try to look at the same uh, uh, trap from a, a hydrogen uh, a point of view. Okay, so that's the exploration aspect. But the other aspect again is the storage. I'm not going to dwell on this thing, but many people uh, uh, look at the entire uh, Sahara, North Africa, with the incredible sunshine. I'm making it very simple, of course. Uh, large areas in the desert, a lot of sunshine and some uh, aquifers down below is, is kind of a, a great place to do green hydrogen, artificially produce green hydrogen, which you can produce in these very unhabited uh, areas. And then you end up having the problem of, of, of storage. And from that hydrogen storage point of view, this is again a very uh, 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 interesting uh, uh, solution possibly is to put the hydrogen back down below this uh, evaporites, which seem to work uh, uh, to a certain extent, holding back certainly conventional uh, resources, oil and gas. And perhaps we should look into the, to the ability of these evaporites and hydrates in particular to hold back hydrogen in a time scale which is uh, uh, making sense. All right, uh, there's this other huge uh, salt basin in North Africa. These are the, the Triassic uh, salt basins. Uh, uh, and then the side note here is that, for example, in the Southern Atlas system in, in Tunisia, uh, people did a lot of good work describing uh, the uh, pre-salt or sub-salt uh, 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 potential. And many of these exploration efforts, which really targeted mostly uh, the post-salt sequence, it's a really mature situation. Uh, all these oil and gas efforts uh, are still there, but uh, our Tunisian colleagues did a lot of good work uh, to make sure that they really uh, exhausted this prospectivity. But now for oil and gas, there is a, a case for uh, going uh, below the Triassic salt and, uh, and lower Jurassic salt, if you will. And then people look at it in, in that way. But the point I'm trying to make here is that what if this situation where people drill and they don't find anything because there's no uh, a kitchen for oil and gas, but the very same trap configuration could be used potentially for hydrogen storage. So it is energy transition thinking, if you will. Uh, basically what I'm saying is that we're gonna have to go back to the drawing table to all of these onshore soil basins and we have to have a new look uh, where we could uh, explore perhaps for uh, hydrogen, natural hydrogen, and where we could potentially put uh, man-made uh, green or blue or whatever uh, hydrogen uh, in the subsurface. And there are some places, and this is examples from Eastern Europe, where, where there is spectacular salt tectonics, but just the data is not there uh, to go beyond. Uh, this is data from the 80s, and this particular part, this particular salt basin with some Triassic salt has not seen modern uh, seismic data since the 80s. Yet this country is caught up in the, uh, in the, in the energy problems uh, we all face in Europe, the war. And uh, one would have to uh, make an effort to, to see what could be done with a very, very thick uh, succession of anhydrides and halides down below. Could we consider some uh, 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 storage uh, project here because there's plenty of salt? Or could we even consider uh, uh, finding natural hydrogen coming up from the 
from the crystalline basement. So there's a lot of uh, work uh, to do. And this brings me to my last slide, and I'm hoping I'm not talking too much. Some personal opinions, uh, perhaps, uh, to take away for all of you who are interested in salt tectonics. What I do see personally in my own workload too is that I don't, uh, I'm not expected to focus so much on uh, the traditional salt tectonics as it relates to oil and gas exploration, but I'm asked to to kind of broaden my research and think about evaporites and mostly in the context of the, of the energy transition. Uh, storage, carbon sequestration, and then what I call renewable energy in the ground aspect, which is, for example, hydrogen, uh, uh, natural hydrogen. These are the, 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 the new things uh, we are asked to, to look into. And what I do see is that, of course, uh, there's a lot of ongoing uh, uh, focus on the large well-known salt giants uh, like the, the, the salt in offshore Brazil, which we can uh, all relate to, or the other side in West Africa, or the Gulf of Mexico, uh, uh, the US and the Mexican part. And then, of course, the, the large uh, paramotriacic salt basins in, in Europe. This is all very good, and we all have to work on this thing. But what I do see uh, as a trend is that, if you recall that map of Europe with the small countries not having any salt uh, to speak of uh, uh, for, for storage, uh, that is not true. There is a lot of salt, small salt basins which didn't see the, the limelight, and we're gonna have to look for these. And uh, we could go back to very, very well explored salt basin. The Nieper Donetsk basin was a good example of this where we have to relook uh, with natural hydrogen exploration in mind and also the hydrogen storage. Okay, and uh, this is uh, really the, the theme for, the, for this other statement is that there are large parts of well-known salt basins, uh, basins which were uh, uh, written off saying that there's no charge there. So they are useless. But with hydrogen in mind and with storage in mind, we're gonna have to go back to these segments and then do some more work. So if anything, and this is my uh, last sentence, the conclusion is that if anything, I don't see uh, the salt tectonics as a, as a principle, something we have to all know about being a, a subject which is gonna be forgotten or, or getting scaled down in the, in the future. But if anything, I see uh, even more so the need to get smart about how salt tectonics or evaporites work in many ways, especially with the energy transition in mind. So I think with this, I'm gonna stop and uh, back to you, uh, Dan. Okay. Let's see where I can get out from this. Thank you, Gabor. Okay. All right, let's see. So 44 after, so I think the timing was okay. Uh, you guys go ahead. You're free to okay. stop share screen, uh, screen sharing as well, if you want to. Okay, let's see, how do I do that? Uh, stop video, okay, here we go. Is it good, Dan? No, just uh, on the top, on the top of your screen, you have stop share. Okay, sorry, uh, I'm not familiar with Zoom. Okay, now it's good, okay? I'll hand over to Nawaz for Q&A. Thank you, Gabor, amazing talk. Yeah, it was a... Very good talk in, in a sense that it gave us a, a broader perspective that uh, was not in uh, general mind of geoscientists. So yes, we have uh, two questions uh, right now on the chat. One is from uh, Piotr Sajewek, and it says, uh, to what degree uh, Permian salts evaporites within the DDB could be recycled, redeposited uh, Devonian salts or evaporites. Similarly, the upper Triassic salts evaporites within the Polish basin being recycled, redeposited uh, Zechstein salt. Evaporites due to extrusion or dissolution. I'm very happy to see that uh, Piotr, a friend of Mine uh, picked up on this uh, uh, sentence I, I, I dropped uh, in the in the talk because. It will be a great topic on its own, how the, the Devonian 
and the Permian salt interact at, at high level? And I don't have a good answer, which uh, could be shared publicly. Uh, I have a little bit of experience, not too much, but I think it's really up to our Ukrainian friends and colleagues to to readdress this uh, issue. And then uh, now they have more and more 3D seismic uh, at their uh, exposal. Of course, their focus is, uh, is somewhere else these days, unfortunately, because of the war. But this is a very, very important topic, which I'm sure they're going to start to get into more and more as the data set will be more and more uh, uh, widespread. It's a huge basin. And then the 3D they have uh, is not covering nearly, uh, I don't want to say something silly, but I don't think they have more 3D than 10, 15% of the entire area. If, if I totally wrong, my Ukrainian friends will forgive me. But this is a very good question, Kurt. Yes, we have another question from Hemant Koye, and he says, uh, thank you, Gabor, for a very interesting overview. Uh, good to see you again. I presume that tectonic uh, iteration of salt provinces may have some impact on potential and target areas. Yeah, uh, thanks, Hemant, for making this uh, good point. Uh, you are a great expert on salt tectonics, and. Uh, and obviously, uh, your presumption is is uh, is correct. I don't have the the figures here, right here, right now, to to address this. But I think somebody like yourself, uh, you should be giving a talk uh, about this uh, <laughs> because you are such an expert. So I'm almost uh, volunteering you to to uh, revisit this uh, question on your own because uh, this is a very good one. Sorry for dodging the question, but I really don't have the materials to give you a good answer right here, right now. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Juan Soto. And he says, uh, thank you, Gabor, for your talk with many thoughts, which are very useful for such of uh, promising projects. So it's more of a comment. And then uh, we received a thank you from Hemin also. and. Uh, uh, Gonzalo, uh, Gonzalo Zamora, uh, he asks that, do you think evaporites can seal enough to allow long hydrogen migration pathways as it is, it is proposed in the monsoon area? Uh, well, Gonzalo, uh, who is a, a Spanish uh, friend of ours, uh, and this is his home turf, so he knows more about this project than, than I do. But this is the million dollar question is that, again, I tried to, to drop it into the talk, is that how good uh, an evaporite should be to hold back hydrogen in particular. If you have halite, if you have dominantly halite succession, you are set, no problem. But if you don't have that luxury, then uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. And then with hydrogen storage, the, the other issue is that how good of a storage you wanna have do you really want to have a 100% uh, airtight uh, 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 super seal, given the fact that you, you, you uh, take down, inject the hydrogen, but you're going to use it like a few months later, if you are trying to beat this yearly production of wind and, uh, and not necessarily wind, but mostly solar. Uh, the other issue is that the economics of the, of the, the hydrogen storage may not require a super super duper uh, uh, seal. So there are a lot of factors, but this is a wonderful uh, question we all have to collectively uh, figure out. In the monsoon area, what I did see is that uh, on, the, on the surface, in the barbastro uh, 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 gypsum might be very, very thick uh, in the subsurface, but it's just the gypsum and it's just uh, uh, an uh, anhydride. So it may not work as a super seal. But again, I don't have any numbers to put on the table. Very good question. Thanks, Gonzalo. No, uh, I cannot hear you, but. Uh... Yeah, sorry. We have okay. another comment from Marcia Karam. Uh, she says, congratulations, uh, Mr. Gabor, an excellent overview. 
And uh, now we don't have anything on the chat yet. And uh, those are the questions. So uh, let me just say uh, one more time is that uh, since Juan Ignacio Soto, a friend of ours from the Bureau of Economic Geology uh, made a comment, uh, among other people, he uh, pointed out this very good paper by Duffy, uh, one of his colleagues from, uh, from, from that shop. And I really think uh, you guys should invite uh, uh, those guys to, to present this uh, really good overview uh, on, on storage situation because it also revolves around the energy transition. This view, new mindset we all have to have uh, coming from uh, the traditional oil and gas uh, uh, relates to salt tectonics kind of uh, storyline. So, and the other person I, I volunteered and, and Hamin will forgive me is that he would be a great uh, speaker to his uh, longstanding, uh, given his longstanding uh, expertise. All right, so this is just uh, two quick uh, statements. Thank you for Any volunteering. <laughs> yeah, we have one more question. Uh, it's from uh, Tarek Kalhoum. He used to work with us. And uh, it's, uh, he says, thanks for the presentation. Is it possible to store hydrogen in halite diaper below 2,000 uh, meters of depth offshore Norway? I think short answer is yes. Uh, the, the longer answer is that our Norwegian colleagues uh, don't have much choice. I mean, whatever they do, it has to be offshore. And our Norwegian colleagues are very good in so many things uh, related to oil and gas, and they work so long in their offshore that I'm sure that they will find a way to address this thing. Of course, they made a lot of progress with the carbon sequestration project, this and that. And uh, whether the hydrogen storage uh, at that depth is going to be on the radar screen, I do not know, but I'm sure that some of them are possibly are looking into it already. I don't know the answer, but it's a good one. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Anna Price. Uh, she says, uh, thank you, Gabor, for the fantastic talk. I was wondering if hydrogen was also found below salt overhangs that would indicate some leakage to shallower levels. That's, and I'm not, I, I sound like a cliche saying that's a very good question, but but it is. I'm not aware of uh, a case like this that hydrogen was found in a gas uh, below an overhang. The problem with all these gases in all these salt basins is that people uh, historically and even today, we are oil and gas companies, we are not looking in, uh, in the gas for hydrogen or helium. We don't care. But, but it would be a good thing from this point on is that, uh, uh, and there are two companies who offer a hydrogen uh, logging in particular. I don't wanna make advertisements for anyone, but, but if you're in a salt basin, if you have gas and possibly you have uh, uh, a hydrogen source below your salt basin, you are sitting on some really old uh, crystalline uh, uh, granitic basement, then chances are that you do have a hydrogen uh, kitchen below you. And if you don't want to drill or you don't have many wells or new wells uh, going all the way down to the below the mother salt, but you have a new well which you just uh, poke down below a salt overhang, then I would recommend to add to the logging program uh, hydrogen and helium. Because if you do find uh, a hydrogen which got away, uh, it had enough time to, to get through the mother salt uh, or through a weld somewhere, then you are sitting on a hydrogen kitchen. So it was a very good question because I don't know of an example, but frankly, I don't expect to see an example uh, looking back historically because people just don't measure for hydrogen, but perhaps a uh, point forward, we as an industry, we should make it more and more as a standard uh, feature in, in, in some of our salt basin exercises.
Yes, we have another question. Uh, Salim Shaker uh, says, uh, distinguish the hydrocarbon from hydrogen trap before we drill. Yeah, these are, uh, is an interesting thing because if you look for a pre-salt uh, target and uh, coming back to the Ukrainian examples I, I showed you, the trap is configured uh, the same way uh, for natural gas, uh, for hydrogen. And what our Ukrainian colleagues found is that you drill into that trap and they were looking for gas, they found a, a blend of gases with uh, hydrogen content up to five, 10, or even 25%. And how the, the hydrogen coexists with the, with the methane uh, or with the natural gas is a long story, but the, the, the trapping configuration in that particular setting is, is the same. So you do have to look for uh, uh, a closure of some sort. Uh, and in many times, uh, like in the Dnieper Donetsk, probably many of the wells which will be drilled are still trying to uh, follow that paradigm that there should be preferentially uh, some sort of closure. But the funny thing about hydrogen uh, is that it doesn't necessarily need a, a closure. This is what some people claim because of, of the nature of its uh, uh, migration, uh, which is a very different storyline from, from different other gases. So to answer the question in another way, you don't necessarily uh, have to have a, a perfect closure if you are looking for hydrogen, natural hydrogen below the salt. Okay, it's a little bit cryptic what I'm saying, but this is uh, how, it, uh, how it shapes up. In fact, the more we look at the hydrogen exploration uh, concepts, uh, in my personal view, I start to see more and more differences compared to oil and gas exploration efforts, even though they have a large overlap. Okay. We have a question from Maria Karam again. Uh, she's asking about the rheology of salt diapers affect the construction of caverns to storage. I would refer to this uh, uh, paper by Duffy. It's, uh, you can find it on the internet. Uh, if you don't find it uh, by Googling or research, it's on ResearchGate. Drop us uh, 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 an email and I would just read that Duffy paper uh, if I were you. Uh, it's, it's an excellent uh, uh, overview of how these salt caverns uh, should be looked at uh, in the 29, uh, 2022 or 23, for that matter. Interestingly, yes. Duffy also is uh, one of the uh, participants here, attendees. <laughs> well, then yeah. he should speak up. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, know, only, so much. Should, only should give another talk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Another question here from, again, uh, Tarek Galhoum. He says, is it possible that the hydrogen is flowing from mounds below the welded salt from basement to Triassic? Whether the uh, hydrogen is uh, migrating? What was the full question? Uh, okay, question is, uh, is it possible that hydrogen is flowing from mounds below the welded salt from the basement to the Triassic, I think, sequence? Well, uh, the way I look at uh, hydrogen uh, migrating is that laterally, uh, it can probably migrate, but I don't expect it uh, 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 to, to migrate so much laterally like uh, the other uh, substances we are used to, oil and gas. So hydrogen has the tendency to, to uh, force itself through uh, vertically. So I think, the hydrogen would go through a, a weld uh, much easier than, than oil and gas, A. Eh? But if it hits a really uh, massive uh, salt uh, feature, and then the thickness of that salt layer is X, which I, I don't have a good handle on, it's not going to be 10 meters, but has to be a few hundred meters, then it's not going to be able to get through that and might be forced uh, to migrate uh, laterally because of this, uh, 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 its buoyancy. So, so we'll, we'll have to see how much uh, 
hydrogen is willing to laterally migrate at what distance? I think my gut feel is that it's not going to be uh, such a big, uh, you know, tens of kilometers numbers as, as we are used to from oil and gas. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Vanessa Assis asks that uh, the layered evaporite sequences uh, can affect the gas storage. It's a question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I refer to, to the Duffy paper, which uh, addresses it head on. Is the, I don't want to say dirty salt, of course, is more problematic. If you have uh, some other units uh, in your beautiful halite shale or some uh, other kind of uh, evaporite layers, then it, it will affect the, the way the, 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 the caving will uh, happen in your artificial uh, storage. Uh, and, and it's a very good paper, and there are many papers on this particular subject. I have a question of my own. Uh, I didn't uh, understand fully the uh, hydrogen kitchen concept. Can you define it in a uh, few words again? Well, it's, it's an ongoing discussion uh, among many people who are specifically working on, on, uh, on uh, natural hydrogen, but, but people do agree that the two main uh, uh, kind of characters, uh, rock types, which can produce uh, hydrogen uh, naturally, is a very old cratonic rocks with granites and uh, some radioactive uh, materials. Uh, you know, the, the East European Craton is a good example, the Australian Cratons or the, the West African Brazilian ones. So this works, uh, everybody agrees that. And the other big group of rocks, which we never look at uh, from the oil and gas business, uh, why would we, is this uh, ophiolite, this, uh, these green rocks, uh, which have the tendency to serpentinize. And then in the process of serpentinization, uh, uh, hydrogen is getting released. And that's, that's an interesting topic on its own, but this is the, the short answer. These two major rock types are the, the main characters. And there are many special cases of, of as some people claim they're even organic way of producing natural hydrogen. So there are, it's, it's, it's a very wide gamut of, 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 of fixing uh, uh, natural hydrogen. Typically, uh, you find natural hydrogen in places where you never looked as a petroleum explorer. So that's that's the cool part for all of us that we get to expose to a very different geology. I think in the next few decades. Another question arises: uh, Usually, ophiolites we see them in the outcrops. So doesn't that uh, uh, is a bad thing because it might uh, get leaked? In the process of well, uh, yeah, the, the hydrogen doesn't come out uh, from the the ophiolites you see on the surface, but and people of course have different claims, but it's a little bit similar to, to oil and gas is that you have to have them at a certain depth at a certain mm -hmm. temperature, and perhaps the pressure has something to do with it, but but the generation of, of hydrogen, the, the process of serpentization uh, has a, a depth curve. It gets more intense as you uh, drop down uh, uh, with depth. And of course, the composition of, of, of the rocks, you start out with peridotites versus uh, simple basalts or whatever, it makes a big difference. But, but the, the, the rocks on the surface never breed uh, 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 hydrogen per se. It has to come up from below. It's similar to oil and gas. Yeah, thank okay. You. I think we uh, questions are. I mean, we see no more questions. Okay, thank uh, you, Navas, uh, and uh, uh, thank uh, you guys. I'll go to Dan. You can say uh, concluding words, Dan. No, nothing to conclude. Just it's it was nice to start the 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 new season. Brilliant talk, brilliant topics, and looking forward to more and more presentations on these topics and cover. Uh, volunteered a lot of people, so drop us an email and let's schedule the talks. There Thanks is again, a Nawaz question also. arrived. Uh, can we ask this last question? Is it okay, Dan? 
Yeah, if Gabor still has. Uh... Sure. Okay. Sure. This is uh, John Davies. He says, uh, "How much energy to flow does hydrogen have? If it if the fill the tiniest holes that are uh, that uh, okay, uh, it fill the tiniest holes that what it is deliverability." Okay. Yeah, that, there are some numbers out there how much uh, hydrogen could be uh, produced from, from a well. And there are some numbers published from the, the only producing natural hydrogen field in Mali, West Africa. And uh, it's producing pretty good, uh, fairly good numbers. Of course, the challenge with that hydrogen find is that it's really, uh, I have to say, in the middle of nowhere. I hope nobody gets uh, uh, offended if I say that. So it's it's a difficult situation to produce hydrogen uh, somewhere that remote. But the numbers are quite healthy. You know, uh, I can email those numbers to you. And uh, the hope for all of us who are looking for natural hydrogen that we could find similar situations somewhere else where the the flow rate will provide economic uh, results uh, for, for producing natural hydrogen, okay? i just email you uh, the answer if, if you uh, contact me, no. all right? Thanks again, Gabor. I think that that concludes our session. And see you all in two weeks. We'll be announcing the next speaker on the social media. Keep in touch. And what a brilliant start to the season. Thank you. Right. Thank you, guys. And have a nice 2023 to all of you. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye, Gabor. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Gabor.